All right, let's get started. So nice to see you all here. My name is Grace Hum. I'm the Dean of Students. Um, and before I introduce our guest speaker, Emerson Sykes, I'd like to talk a little bit about where we are and why we're here. Um, we're at a crossroads in the middle of an intersection between the values <laughs> of free speech and inclusion. And as it turns out, a lot of other higher ed institutions are standing with us in the same intersection. As educators, we care deeply about creating a learning environment where our students feel a sense of belonging, a learning environment where our students know that their experiences and views as historically underrepresented students are valued in ways that help us move forward towards change, towards equity, towards a more just society. But we also know that as educators at a public institution, free speech, including the expression of unpopular ideas, is the foundation of inquiry and exploration that enables us to fulfill our mission to develop our students as critical thinkers, lawyers, and leaders. When free speech controversies arise on campus, like they did for us last spring, there's no easy answer. We cannot turn left or right from the intersection and believe that our path is clear. That is to say, we cannot wave the First Amendment flag as the reason to do nothing. And at the same time, we cannot wave the DEI flag as the reason to do everything. But instead of pitting free speech values against inclusion values, as though this were a zero-sum game, we have to find a way to think about these values and how they work together to enrich our campus environment. This work requires us to engage with each other on these hard issues, to challenge each other, to give each other opportunities to learn from each other, to have difficult conversations in which we might disagree, all in an effort to have a productive dialogue to get to the place where we all want to go, an inclusive environment where we learn and grow together as individuals and as a community. Today's keynote remarks given by Emerson Sykes, a senior staff attorney with the ACLU Speech, Privacy, and Technology Project, where he focuses on First Amendment free speech protections and racial justice issues, um, is a really exciting event, not just for us today, but in an ongoing way. I invited him, not because I think he is the panacea to all of our problems, but because I think his expertise his knowledge and his skills could help us as a community have these deeper, richer conversations about the tension of free speech and inclusion. I first reached out to Emerson in early May, actually stalked him <laughs> online and specifically on LinkedIn. I watched a lot of him on YouTube. I mean, a lot. It turns out that you can binge lots of Emerson Sykes online <laughs> if you're so inclined, just like Netflix. I became fixated because all the, of all the people across the country um, talking about the First Amendment, campus speech, diversity, equity, inclusion, he was the only person that I could find that seemed to be explicitly talking about all of these things together and trying to really dig deep in thinking about how to address these issues. As I said, there's no one easy answer. There's no one simple way to resolve these things. We talk about all of these things together to figure out right, our way together. So once Emerson responded to my outreach, I blitzed him. I came up with all sorts of ways that he could engage and interact with our community um, and just named it our Practitioner in Residence event series. Um, he graciously agreed. Yesterday, he spoke to the faculty on the topic of academic freedom and racial justice on campus, and specifically about the litigation um, that the ACLU and he is involved in um, in Florida this month against the Stop Woke Act to ensure that educators could continue teaching about systemic inequality, structural racism, and unconscious bias. He also facilitated a three and a half hour training for almost 20 student leaders last night on the topic of the First Amendment for student activists to create space for students to wrestle with hard questions around free speech and social justice issues on campus. The goal of the training was to support student activism, which we know is very central to many of our students' identity. 
He also held office hours today and met with many of our student organizations and other um, community members. In short, in addition to, the, to today's uh, um, keynote remarks, Emerson has spent a lot of time with us to share his experience, his expertise, and his perspective, which I hope gives us all fodder for re reflection and more opportunity for connection with each other. And though his visit ends today, I look forward to continuing to hang out at the intersection of the First Amendment and inclusion with all of you and continuing to have these hard conversations. Okay, so for now, a little bit about Emerson's background, and it is really my deep honor and pleasure to introduce him. Prior to joining the ACLU in 2018, he was a legal advisor for Africa at the International Center for Not-for-Profit Law. In that role, he provided technical legal assistance to civil society leaders, government officials, law students, and other stakeholders across Africa to improve the legal framework protecting the freedom of association, assembly, and expression on the regional and national levels. From 2012 to 2013, he served as Assistant General Counsel to the New York City Council, where he worked to increase transparency for council members' discretionary spending and contributed to the council's friend of the court brief against the New York Police Department's stop and frisk program. In 2011, Emerson was a senior policy fellow in the office of a member of parliament in Ghana. He previously conducted research and wrote about US foreign policy for the Century Foundation, a progressive think tank, and worked for the National Democratic Institute's Central and West Africa team. His keynote remarks are entitled Free Speech, Academic Freedom, and Racial Justice, an ACLU Lawyer's Perspective, and he'll provide a practitioner's personal view of how and why the First Amendment can be a tool for progressive social change based on his experiences from South Africa to South Los Angeles. Please help me welcome Emerson Sykes. Thanks very much. I don't have to stand here, right? I, th I think this is on. Thanks very much, Grace, uh, and thank you all for coming. I think I'll just start by saying, you know, there is a bit of an elephant in the room at UC Hastings when we talk about free speech and racial justice. And I'm not here to sort of relitigate or hash through who did what, when, and how, and who broke what rules in March of this year. Uh, but I do want to say that the reason I accepted Grace's invitation is because it is my primary goal to support student activists, right? And so when I spoke with some folks uh, who were involved in the protest uh, last school year, I asked, I said, look, would it be helpful for me to come to share some information about the First Amendment, to share my perspective on why, even as we try to tear down so many social structures, why the principle of free speech is something worth uh, preserving. And they said, you know what, I think that kind of information might help, might add something to the dialogue, so that's why I'm here today. So I want to start with some breaking news. As Grace mentioned, in the last couple of weeks, we at the ACLU National, along with the ACLU of Florida and the NAACP Legal Defense Fund and pro bono counsel at Ballard Spar, have sued to stop uh, the enforcement of Florida's Stop Woke Act. Raise your hand if you've heard of the Stop Woke Act. So Ron DeSantis, the governor of Florida, has passed a few different laws, the Don't Say Gay Law. Uh, there are several others that are sort of all sort of weighing in on some culture war type of issues. And one of them is the Stop Woke Act. Governor DeSantis said, we want a woke-free state of Florida. But I think it's important to where we start this conversation, right? I hesitate to start the conversation with Ron DeSantis because I think what's important to note is that discussions around how we think about and talk about our history as a country in public schools is a debate and an issue that has been with us since the founding of the country. Right? Public education has always been uh, a sort of political football on both sides of the political spectrum. And so there's nothing really new about the idea that we're arguing about what is our history and who are our heroes and what kinds of stories can be told. And for generations, we had a whitewashed history in our schools, right? Over the last few decades, there's been significant progress in trying to present a more inclusive and representative curriculum in our schools. 
Uh, and what we're seeing now is the backlash to that project, to that progress. And I'll say it's no coincidence that at the ACLU, our free speech team spent about a year and a half doing nothing but defending racial justice protesters, right? And we have spent the last year and a half, or I have, working on these anti-inclusive education bills. And I don't think it's a coincidence that in the wake of this reckoning, a national reckoning with how we think about and talk about race in this country, we've seen these efforts to squash that conversation and to prohibit certain viewpoints from being shared. So I want to tell you a little bit about this lawsuit, but we're going to cover some ground today. We're not going to stay here for very long. So the Stop Woke Act. There are eight prohibited concepts which are lifted directly from President Trump's Executive Order 13950. That was blocked by a federal court. It was withdrawn by President Biden. But nonetheless, it's gone on to live a thousand lives because it's been cut and pasted into hundreds of policies and state bills around the country. Now, this list of eight so-called divisive concepts is interesting because some of them are seemingly innocuous. You know, the first concept is that you're not allowed to teach that one race or sex is inherently morally superior to another. No one was really teaching that to begin with. So banning it doesn't really stifle anyone's speech in particular, but it's still kind of strange. Some of the provisions, some of the concepts are nonsensical. So my favorite uh, is there's one that says that you're not allowed to teach that anyone cannot or should not attempt to treat others without respect to race, sex, gender, or national origin. A, a judge, actually our judge in Florida, recently ruled that this same provision in the employment concept, quote, achieved the, rail, the rare triple negative. <laughs> so some of these things are just obviously on their face, ungrammatical, nonsensical, and unconstitutionally vague. There's another category of these concepts, though, that directly target topics of public debate. For example, you're not allowed to teach that meritocracy, objectivity, or colorblindness are racist or sexist concepts. Now, people might not agree with the idea that colorblindness is racism, but I know that there are multiple professors in this very law school who believe and teach, based on mountains of research and evidence, that colorblindness can be racist. Right? And as I said, you don't have to necessarily agree with that perspective, but what's the case now in Florida is that it's a violation of the law to teach that colorblindness can be a racist concept. And that's on penalty of termination, on penalty of individual lawsuits being filed against you through this law, and the withdrawal of funding for your public institution of higher education. Another one is that you're not allowed to teach that anyone has specific status or privilege based on their race or sex. So you're not allowed to teach the idea that there is such a thing as white privilege. Again, that's a topic of public debate. Some people might think that that's not such a thing. But what's made, what, what the Stop Woke Act has said is that you're allowed to criticize the idea of white privilege, but you're not allowed to promote it. There's another uh, clause in the Stop Woke Act that says that concepts can be discussed, but they must be discussed in a, quote, objective way and without endorsement. Now, this was actually an attempt to cover some of the loopholes in earlier versions of these laws. So we filed the first federal lawsuit challenging one of these statewide laws in Oklahoma last year. And that law was, had mostly the same list of uh, concepts it only applied to uh, K-12, the, the, the concepts did. Uh, but the way that it said it was you could not make any of these concepts a part of a course, which we argued meant that you're not even allowed to mention them. Never mind speak about them in one way or another. You're, if you can't make them a part of the course, you can't even mention them. You can't even bring them up. But the Stop Woke Act attempted to cover their behinds a little bit in this regard and said, of course you can discuss these topics. We're not prohibiting you from bringing these things up, but they have to be done, they have to be covered in an objective way and without endorsement. And they also threw in a nice little nugget where there's mandatory black history curricula also. So insulating themselves from the argument that you're prohibiting talk about racism or talk about race, which I argue the Oklahoma law did. 
But what's unique about the Stop Woke Act, despite these efforts to sort of cover some of the loopholes, one is this objective and without endorsement, we argue, is unconstitutionally vague. What does it mean to cover something objectively, uh, especially in a higher ed context? But what the Stop Woke Act did that no other law has done is applied the eight prohibited concepts to higher education. And these are purely viewpoint-based restrictions on academic freedom in higher education, and that's unconstitutional. So we sued on behalf of uh, eight professors. Our lead, uh, our lead plaintiff is the very handsome Professor Leroy Purnell, who's a FAMU law professor and former dean. And as I said, it's a, a lawsuit on behalf of, the, or filed by the ACLU, the ACLU of Florida, the Legal Defense Fund, and Ballard Spar. So since this is a, a legal crowd, I'll go into a tiny bit of detail about the case itself. Uh, we, we bring four claims, two under the First Amendment, uh, based on the viewpoint-based regulation of academic speech by instructors. I'll note that instructors includes professors, non-tenured professors, adjuncts, even possibly teaching assistants or students who are leading a particular session because it it's limits instruction, right? And then what it says what an instructor is not allowed to do. And we think that that should be interpreted broadly because on university campuses, people wear different hats at different times. They're students, they're teachers, they're instructors, they're TAs, they're staff members. Uh, they do a lot of different things on campus. So we argue this covers a lot of folks. There's the right to academic speech. There's also a right to receive information that's recognized under the First Amendment. And so we sued on students' behalf. We represent one uh, FSU student who's a very brave student activist who actually testified against the Stop Woke Act uh, in the legislature. And I think she has a particularly compelling narrative. I mean, tying in with some of the things that happened here, you know, people often say, well, protesting is all well and good, but you need to actually engage in the process. And this plaintiff, she engaged. She's testified twice against this law, and now she's one of the plaintiffs against this law. So, you know, I'm not saying that there's only one way to, to protest or that you have to stay within the box, but we think that it's a particularly compelling narrative that this is someone who has stood up. She participated in the process, and she's continuing to challenge this in defense of her education and those of her colleagues. Uh, and then the one declarant, I'll say, oh, so sorry, Academic free right to receive information, vagueness. As I mentioned, there are some provisions that are obviously unconstitutionally vague. And this is related to, but separate from the First Amendment issue, right? It's a due process violation. People often conflate vagueness, due process, and First Amendment, but they're actually separate. Um, which we think is important, right? In such a politically charged issue, in many cases, in, in Oklahoma, our lead claim was a vagueness claim. We got an unfriendly judge, we were in an unfriendly circuit, and we needed to lean into the fact that whatever you think about quote unquote wokeness, these laws violate due process because teachers' licenses are at stake for violating laws that nobody understands. We have a slide deck that a school district produced that said, here's your guidelines for how to implement HB 1775, and on that one about cannot and should not, they wrote, nobody knows what this means. And you can lose your job, you can lose your license if you violate a law that nobody knows what it means. Uh, the final claim is equal protection. We argue that the, based on the legislative record, it's obvious that there was uh, discriminatory and racist intent in the passage of the law. We moved for a preliminary injunction on the first three claims, the First Amendment and the due process claims. As I mentioned, we have eight plaintiffs, seven professors, one student, and then one declarant. And the one declarant is a non-tenured professor. We really wanted to represent the non-tenured voice because we think that these are some of the most vulnerable people. They're the most likely to get complaints lodged against them. They have the fewest protections if they expose their university to any sort of liability. And not surprisingly, it was a hard, we had a hard time finding folks who were willing to stick their necks out and be plaintiffs. Uh, and so, you know, we don't blame them for that. They have their real risk. Uh, but it was to the detriment of our case because we really did want to bring that narrative uh, into view. So we did get one declaration, uh, one declarant. They weren't willing to be a plaintiff, but they were a non-tenured person did sort of tell their story, which we think is key. Uh, and then we have eight defendants, the Florida Board of Governors of the State University System of Florida, the Education Commissioner, and the Boards of Trustees of the universities that the different um, professors come from. 
So, you know, when we think of academic freedom, when we think of racial justice being intention, we think of academic freedom sort of being a code word for the right of powerful professors to say offensive things, I want to change the narrative a little bit. This is an academic freedom case. This is also a racial justice case. So I want to take a step back uh, at this point and tell you a little bit about how I came to this work. So at the ACLU, I focus on campus speech. I spend a lot of time on campuses. I'm very happy to be on this one right now. And I want to start with a picture of my parents who were both born and raised in Shreveport, Louisiana and made their way up north to Harvard. This is my mom and my dad. And if you ask them about sort of what it was like to be in college in the 60s in the height of the civil rights movement, they were not you know, notable activists on campus. And if you ask people who I went to college with, some of whom are your, on the faculty here, uh, they would also not have identified me as a particular activist, to be honest. But what my dad said was coming from Shreveport, Louisiana in 1968, the most revolutionary thing he could do was go to class. And he said, you know, he, he encouraged me to, to understand the idea that there are many situations in which your presence is protest. And just being, taking up space in certain places is its own form of activism. And this is not to say that you shouldn't have more vocal forms of activism or to let us off the hook and say everybody should just go to class and be quiet. It's not that at all. But it is to say, you know, there's a time for raising fists and, 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 and bullhorns, but there's all sorts of different ways that people can, cha can make change and be activists in different spaces. So after, soon after my parents graduated from college, they made their way um, to Phillips Academy, which is where I was born and raised. So I grew up on a campus. This is why it's in my DNA. That's actually my hometown, if you can believe it. So part of you know growing up running around campus was is is part of why i get that special chill on the back of my neck every time i start seeing campus buildings but there's another part of the story i want to tell which is about uh my cousin ollie so when i was about 15 uh my cousin that's big cousin ollie right here i was at phillips academy that amazingly idyllic picture you just saw. I was a student there. And my cousin Ollie, who's almost the same age as me, who's from Watts, was arrested, uh, convicted, and imprisoned for felony murder. And he's been in state penitentiary in San Diego ever since. He and, he and his friend robbed an old lady and his friend killed her. Uh, and so, you know, every step along the way, since we were 15 years old, as I went from Andover to Stanford and traveled all over the world and went to graduate school and now have become a civil rights litigator, Cousin Ali has been in state pen the whole time and he's been right over my shoulder. So when I talk about you know the importance of our presence being a form of protest, it's not to let us off the hook, but I think it's an important reminder that our presence here is not promised. And it's there, but for the grace of God, we could be in very different places. So I think it's important to, for him to be here with us today. Now, focusing on black student activism specifically, the moment when sort of black student activism really started to hit home for me and the, the idea of the power of black student activism really comes from my experience in South Africa. So in 1997, I went with a close family friends, the Mokubelas, who were in exile from South Africa. Mandela was president, apartheid had recently fallen. And I walked these very streets where these student activists, many of them in their school uniforms, as you can tell in these pictures, took to the streets to overturn an oppressive system. And nearly 20 years later, or 21 years later, when I was there, I was able to experience it and see the massive change that had been created by this activism. Of course, this South Africa is complicated today. It's not a simple story. I don't mean to paint a rosy picture, but what it taught me was that change is possible. Massive change is possible. And the only thing that's guaranteed 
is change. And so it was on the backs of these student activists that I decided to devote myself to, to supporting that type of social change. And several years later, when I uh, came back, after I finished law school, I found myself back in South Africa quite a bit, actually, uh, in the job that Grace was talking about, working in sub-Saharan Africa on civil society issues. And I ended up teaching a short course at the University of Pretoria Center for Human Rights. This is me with a longer beard and less gray hair. And it's actually this course that grew into the workshop that we did last night. And we did this course for the, the Center for Human Rights, which a little bit of background. Pretoria used to be known as the heartland of the Afrikaners, right? During apartheid, it was sort of the, I don't know if the, the, the it was like the Mississippi of South Africa. Um, and, but, and, the University of Pretoria now hosts at their, at their law school, the Center for Human Rights, which brings young African lawyers from all over the continent for a master's in human rights program. And this is one class. And these are folks literally from every corner of the continent of Africa. They're LGBTQ activists, they're uh, environmental activists, anti-mining, uh, women's rights, political opposition leaders, all sorts of just incredibly albino disability rights folks, just incredibly brilliant and powerful folks who all come together to learn together and to train to go out and run, Af run African human rights organizations in the, or at the national level, at the regional level. Many of them become law professors. They go on to do all sorts of amazing things. And it was among these folks and seeing, they're so, they're so incredibly tight-knit and powerful in the industry that in African human rights, everybody calls them the mafia, the, the, the Pretoria mafia. But I think it was just another type of illustration of these African student activists going out and making massive change throughout the continent and creating hope and change wherever they went. So I, I wanted to also bring those incredible individuals into this story as well. But I wanna change, change gears a little bit and, and go closer to the present. Because in 2018, after several years of doing what I thought was my dream job, traveling around Africa and working on human rights. Trump got elected, my family had a second kid, and it seemed like it was time to come back and work in the United States. And so I joined the ACLU. And for those of you who are not familiar, the ACLU has worked for over 100 years on civil rights and civil liberties. Uh, we have one thing that I think is unique about the ACLU is that we have affiliates in all 50 states. We have three in California, NorCal, SoCal, and San Diego and Imperial counties. And you know, when I was working in international human rights, a lot of what we did was support nonprofit organizations, big ones, little ones, medium-sized ones, as well as international organizations, organizations that work in lots of different countries. But I am not aware of any organization working on any, in any, anywhere in the world with the coverage that the ACLU has. All 50 states and a massively wide array of issue areas. Within the ACLU National, we have our communications team, we have our public advocate, uh, political advocacy department, of course our development team, which raises the money, and then within the legal department, where I am, we're divided up into thematic teams. So there's the Women's Rights Project, the LGBTQ work, we have immigrants' rights, national security, racial justice, and I'm on the Speech, Privacy, and Technology Project. And when I was leaving uh, the International Center for Not-for-Profit Law, when I was working in Africa, to come to the ACLU, one of the questions I faced was, don't you know who they represent? Don't you know the ACLU represents Nazis? And my response was, look, I know what the ACLU does, but they do it in a principled way. And I've seen what happens when there's no protection for dissenting views. And I believe that their, their mission is noble. And so I decided to jump in head first. I knew when I was joining the ACLU, my future boss told me, he was like, look, 
You're going to get to work on some incredibly uh, important and interesting things. It's going to be very difficult at times. And in return, we'll teach you how to litigate 10 years into your legal career. So it seemed like a deal worth taking. But I came in knowing full well that there were going to be some massive tensions in the work. Right? It was literally coming in after Charlottesville, where the ACLU uh, of Virginia had advocated on behalf of the Unite the Right uh, organizers when their permit was revoked. And then, uh, I guess, 36 hours later, someone was killed by a car. So in the aftermath of that, the ACLU had a massive internal as well as external reckoning with how we deal with First Amendment and racial justice as sometimes competing or at least principles that can be in tension. And what the ACLU asked from me was, they said, look, we need somebody who deeply believes in the importance of free speech and who also deeply understands the importance of racial justice. And so that has become the crux of my work. And in or But again, I think it's important where we start the story because I'm not the first to do this work by any means. Early on as I uh, was joining the ACLU, I started hearing about Eleanor Holmes Norton, who you may know as the uh, representative for DC in Congress, the non-voting representative of DC in Congress. But earlier in her career, in the late 1960s, when my parents were arriving in Cambridge, Massachusetts, she was at the ACLU, back when there were like three lawyers at all of ACLU National. Now there are about 400. Uh, it was a very different ACLU, but even then, they did a lot of incredibly important work and they were involved in all of the huge cases. And she, as a black woman, a young black woman who was deeply involved in the civil rights movement, fresh out of law school, even re represented uh, the notoriously racist Governor George Wallace to protect his right to hold a rally at Shea Stadium. And she said, she said, look, my friends at SNCC, the, the Student Nonviolent uh, Coordination Committee, I think that's what it stands for, uh, we're, we're the civil rights organization, we're saying, how can you defend these bigots? And she said she knew, she understood that the case law and the doctrine that was created representing these racist folks was going to be used against the civil rights movement the very next day, and so it was very important where these lines were drawn. And her, her friend said, yeah, but you know, what's good for the goose isn't going to be taste the same for the gander, which was an amazing black grandma way of describing it. Uh, but she and, and she said, look, I knew that the power dynamics were there. Neutral rules were not going to save us from inherent structural problems. But nonetheless, where we draw these lines matter. And we've got to be very careful about giving the government too much authority to shut down speech it doesn't like. So we're all lawyers or law adjacent here. So I'm going to spend a few minutes with the text. It's short, so we'll read it. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. So I want to make a few observations about the text. First is the first word, Congress. We think of the First Amendment as protecting free speech. It's kind of weird that the first word is Congress. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the African Charter on Human and People's Rights, they all protect freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of assembly, freedom of belief. But the first word in each of those documents or uh, of each of those provisions is everyone or all people have the right to blah, blah, blah. Everyone has the right to freedom of speech. That's not what the First Amendment says. It doesn't say everyone has the right to freedom of religion and freedom of speech. It says Congress shall make no law respecting these rights. And so I'm sure you've heard this and I'll come back to it again and again, but the First Amendment is about regulating government authority, constraining government authority. It's not actually about the rights we all hold. It's about the government's authority to regulate religion, speech, press, assembly, and petition the government. 
Free speech as a principle is much broader than the First Amendment, right? There are free speech principles that we can have between friends. But the First Amendment only comes into play when you have government action. The next observation I want to make is, is stolen directly and unashamedly from Burt Newborn, the legendary professor at NYU and an ACLU uh, OG, as we say. He says that there's a, a reason for the ordering of the five freedoms in the First Amendment. Religion, speech, press, assembly, and petition the government. I call it an activist reading of the First Amendment. So first, you want to, the government can't tell you what it's okay to think or believe, your religion, your faith, the things in your head, right? The government also can't abridge your freedom of speech. So now we've traced this from an idea in your head to an idea that you've communicated to those people around you or of the press. So now we've had an idea, we've communicated it to those within earshot, and now we're gonna publish it in some way. Obviously they were talking about the printing press. We can think of all sorts of other ways that we can disseminate ideas across time and space. But we've taken it from an idea to some words to the published word. And the right of the people peaceably to assemble. Okay, so now you've shared your idea, you've published your idea, and now you're gonna gather around your idea. You're gonna mobilize, you're gonna have solidarity, you're gonna come together uh, uh, to feel solidarity around this. And to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Now you're gonna come in your numbers to the seat of power and ask for change in your, side, in your society, in your culture, in your country. So with this reading, we, un we can understand the First Amendment really as protecting the journey from an idea to a social movement. And I think it's with that concept in mind that I sort of understand the First Amendment as an activist's best friend. But of course the text is short and it packs a lot in there. So what are some key ideas that I think we should remember about the First Amendment? And apologies for those of you who are in con law right now, I promise this will be short. A few key things to keep in mind. Content and viewpoint-based regulations are highly disfavored under the First Amendment, right? If it's a content-based restriction, if you're restricting the speech because of what someone is saying, you have to pass strict scrutiny. And good luck, like two laws have ever passed strict scrutiny. A viewpoint-based regulation is per se unconstitutional. Some courts say you don't even have to apply strict scrutiny. If you're shutting down speech simply because of the viewpoint it expresses, because they are pro and not con any given thing, it's per se unconstitutional. What the government can do is regulate the time, place, and manner of speech. You may have heard about this. But it cannot regulate almost never the content and truly never the viewpoint of private speakers. And again, here we're talking about the government regulating private speakers. The government can speak on its own behalf and express its own viewpoint. People can you know, create communities where they can regulate content or viewpoint, maybe even on social media. But the First Amendment says that the government cannot regulate in that way. We, you know, my background is in international human rights and in the student workshop yesterday, we had some students with different international backgrounds. And you know, it's true that in the United States, we have more robust protections for free speech than almost anywhere else in the world. But not all speech, even here, is, unprotect is, is protected. There are categories of what we call unprotected speech, which you may have be familiar with. Defamation, true threats, fighting words, obscenity, harassment, incitement. These may seem like vague things that could encompass quite a bit, but in our legal system, they're very narrowly defined. Defamation, for instance, has a different definition in the UK, it's much broader. But here, in order to be convicted of de defamation or found, to, or, in, or found to have defamed someone, we're currently um, challenging New Hampshire's criminal defamation law. We think that you should never have criminal defamation laws, only civil penalties for defamation. But in the United States, defamation means that you are intentionally lying about someone in order to purposefully hurt their reputation, right? It's not enough to be wrong, it's not enough to be mean, it's not enough to say things that are unkind or even untrue. It has to be purp a purposeful 
lie to, with the intent to hurt somebody. Similarly, true threats, fighting words, harassment are narrow categories. Obscenity is a little bit broader than we would like. It's supposed to be anything that has no, it's purely for purian interest and has no redeeming uh, artistic value. But to be honest, the obscenity category uh, has been stretched more than these others. And incitement is one that we hear a lot about in terms of January 6th. It's one that I've thought a lot about. And I've written about the Brandenburg test, which establishes a narrow window for prosecutions around incitement. This was an ACLU case in 1969 where we represented a KKK member and established the, the principle that in order to hold one person responsible for unlawful activities by somebody else, you've got to show that they intended for the unlawful activity to happen, that it was objectively likely to happen imminently, right? So it's not just enough to say, oh, you advocated for something and later on someone else did it. We have to have a very close linkage between what someone said and what someone else did because we're very nervous about vicarious liability on account of speech. And we used, by the way, this exact argument to defend DeRay McKesson in the Supreme Court. When an unidentified, he, was, he participated in a protest in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, uh, outside of a, a police station after the killing of Alton Sterling. And during this protest where people were in the street across from the police station, an unidentified person threw an unidentified object and hit an unidentified police officer. And without any claim that DeRay McKesson had anything to do with actually throwing, he doesn't know who threw it, he doesn't know, he didn't tell them to throw it, because he was the organizer of the protest, and because he was engaging in some arguable level of civil disobedience by blocking the street, they want to hold him responsible for the injuries to this police officer. And we said, no, you cannot do that under the Brandenburg test or other principles of vicarious liability. So this is a very, very tangible <laughs> example of exactly what Eleanor Holmes Norton predicted. What you'll notice in this list of unprotected speech is hate speech is not there. Why is that? What do we just talk about? The kind of speech that government can't regulate. People are shy because it's stadium seating. It's a viewpoint, right? Would you call hate? Somebody else might not call hate. It's not a time, place, and manner restriction, right? And hate speech is a, is a viewpoint as described by the, by the Supreme Court. Offensiveness is a viewpoint. When I say that, I don't mean to say that it's easy or simple that the, or that there aren't devastating consequences of that. But I think we can understand the logic, at least. A couple more key ideas. Public versus private universities. Public universities are the government. Private universities are not, therefore they're not governed by the First Amendment, except in California, where there's a thing called Leonard's Law, where even private universities are essentially governed by the First Amendment. We talked a little bit about K college versus K-12 and the different ways in which free speech applies. Uh, and we think of you know K-12 cases from, from Tinker to Mahanoy. Tinker was uh, about the, the black armbands and Mahanoy was the everybody's favorite fuck cheer case, which you may have heard about on, on Snapchat. But when it comes, we'll talk a little bit more about the special considerations for higher education uh, from Sweezy to speech first in a second. But I would just want to note that college students have it tough, right? This college is a place where you live, it's where you learn, it's where you work, it's where you teach, and it's a special place where we say that anybody has especially strong freedoms to say whatever they want. So I don't want to pretend that that is easy to deal with. But here are some common free speech issues. In the classroom, you know, between student and faculty speech, in dorms or university housing, distribution of flyers on campus, bulletin boards, chalking, these are things that you've probably seen in the headlines in countless universities. Protests and counter protests, speakers invited by university affiliates or student clubs or academic departments, this one might sound especially familiar. Speakers renting space on campus, 
And then there's always issues around the administration response. It's usually several hours too late and several degrees too lukewarm. And almost always they include my least favorite phrase, which is, this does not reflect who we are as a community. <laughs> I don't think you put that one in, Grace, but. <laughs> uh, and then there's also extramural faculty speech. So things that faculty say on their own time. I'm gonna skip this, but this basically, I wanted to highlight sort of a, 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 another word on academic freedom and then I'm done with the law prof part of the talk. So I just wanted to highlight sort of what the Supreme Court has said about academic freedom. It says, to impose any straitjacket upon the intellectual leaders in our college and universities would imperil the future of our nation. They talk about how, especially in the social sciences where nothing is absolute, scholarship cannot flourish in an atmosphere of suspicion and distrust. Teachers and students must always remain free to inquire, to study, and to evaluate to gain new maturity and understanding. Otherwise, our civilization will stagnate and die. Now, academic freedom is not actually even in the First Amendment, right? And many cases have said it's not an enumerated right. But somehow, the entire weight of our civilization rests upon academic freedom, according to the Supreme Court. They say our nation is deeply committed to safeguarding academic freedom, which is of transcendent value to all of us and not merely the teachers concerned. That freedom is therefore a special concern of the First Amendment, which does not tolerate laws that cast a pall of orthodoxy over the classroom. So I'm biased, but I'd say the First Amendment is sort of special ground within the Constitution. And apparently academic freedom is special ground within that special ground. So you would think that this is a really robust right that we've written a lot about and litigated a lot about and we understand quite deeply. The truth is when you really start digging at it, academic freedom is more of a vibe. <laughs> There's even a circuit split about who has academic freedom. There are some circuits that say it only rests with an institution, right? Academic freedom is about protecting public universities from the intrusion by other branches of government. That's their limited understanding of what academic freedom actually means. I would say that that's a like devastatingly narrow view, but that's what some circuits have held. The most common version is around faculty speech, but as I said, some courts have said there's no clear individual right to academic freedom. It's only an institutional right. But off, many courts have said, you know, the faculty do have an interest in academic freedom. And then you get into a whole set of questions. And your professors, when I was talking to them on uh, Tuesday, yesterday, had a lot of questions about this, about whether it's a matter of public interest, about whether it's inside or outside the classroom, uh, and whether it's sort of within their area of expertise, or whether they're just kind of spouting off in a physics class. An open question is how much academic freedom interest students have. And the case law is thin on this, but it's a kind of my pet project to assert that academic freedom is not just about tenured professors, but also about all the different ways that people participate in the academic life of these institutions. So you'll see us argue for students' academic freedom rights, but courts are not generally super uh, eager to, 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 to embrace that idea. But with all these sort of campus speech incidents that occur regularly, unfortunately, I'm here to say UC Hastings, you're not that special. These, these things happen a lot of places. I know that it hurts. It doesn't feel better to know that it happens elsewhere, but it's happened so many times, so many places, and it happens repeatedly. And so part of the question for us as the ACLU was, what can and should we do about it as an organization that's deeply committed to free speech and racial justice? So one of the things we've done is develop these workshops for student activists. And it was developed with the support of the UC National Center on Free Speech and Civic Engagement. We've run it at UC San Diego, at Berkeley, at Stanford, and a few other places, and now here. And the idea is to give students the tools, as we said, to navigate these difficult questions. We start with, an, you know, with a totally biased premise. We are pro-free speech. 
right? We're going to make the case for why we think there should be robust protections for free speech, but we're doing it in a way, I think, that, that speaks to, to activists' impulse to challenge authority and to help them understand the ways in which free speech is ultimately to their benefit. And to give space for the really hard questions about what the implications of free speech are, because they are difficult. And I'll talk a little bit about what that's been like for me at the ACLU with one final case. I'm going to do one more case, and then I'll I have a little bit of a closing. How are we doing on time? Good. A little bit, yeah. Quickly, Arkansas State. Turning Points USA. Raise your hand if you've heard of Turning Points USA. Yes. Turning Points USA, a strongly sort of Trump-aligned student group, was trying to start a student group at Arkansas State. And they, one of their, they were tabling in the, in the main plaza to try to get signatures to get people to sign up for this new chapter. The ACLU of Arkansas had long criticized this policy. It creates free speech zones. It requires pre-approval before you can set up uh, a table. It has all these excessive regulations that require the school to approve before you can use these ostensibly public spaces. It's something that we had been against for a long time. And it was used against Turning Points USA, who were uh, one of their students was arrested for tabling without authorization. And so the Alliance Defending Freedom, which is a legal organization that is very difficult for me to even say the name of because they are so antithetical to everything sort of we believe in. Uh, but they asked us, they said, hey, we know you don't like the Arkansas state policy either. Do you want to join us in this lawsuit on behalf of Turning Points USA? And so what we did was, and you can argue it was a little too cute, but what we did was we said, look, there's a very important constitutional principle at play. But we have no interest in representing the particular speech of Turning Points USA. So we wrote an amicus brief, which is a, a friend of the court brief, uh, which you we don't talk a lot about in law school. Uh, but there's a, there's a, maybe it's apocryphal, but Justice Thomas says he doesn't read any amicus briefs except those written by the ACLU. So maybe that's not true. But the idea is that the ACLU will quite frequently weigh in on cases as an amicus, uh, even when we are not joining as counsel. And so we did that here on behalf of a, a group called Peace and Love, a progressive racial justice organization that had also had trouble tabling. And so we were able to write a brief that said, look, we have no sympathy for Turning Points USA and their particular political views, and the policy that was used against them is unconstitutional. I didn't sleep well, I didn't eat well that week. There was a lot of internal wrangling within the ACLU about how could we stand up for Turning Points USA, but in the end, I feel like we did the right thing. So in two minutes, I wanna leave you with a closing, some closing thoughts about how we do and do not talk about and think about the First Amendment. So starting with the don'ts. Any argument, and there are a lot of arguments in favor of free speech. As I said, I'm in favor of free speech, but there are a lot of arguments in favor of free speech that I think do more harm than good. The first is any argument that's based on the inherent genius of the signers of the Bill of Rights. This one has a red spot over all of the signers who had slaves. So that as a premise, because the founders said so, you lost me. The next one is kids these days. There's a big strain of like kid, there's the new generation doesn't understand free speech. They're not understanding the sacrifices that are necessary to live in a democratic society. Also, I don't have time for it. It wasn't better before. Young student activists are questioning everything in beautiful ways and trying to tear down all sorts of structures. My only point is let's preserve free speech because it's in all of our best interests. The last thing I avoid is this idea of the marketplace of ideas. How fresh are these insights? So this does creep into our briefs sometimes because Supreme Court uses this kind of language. But the marketplace of ideas is this idea that if we all just let everybody speak, then truth and justice will eventually sort of win out and emerge to the top with by some invisible hand. And I think if I don't trust actual markets, free markets to yield just outcomes, neither do I trust the marketplace of ideas to inevitably yield peace or justice. But 
I understand that without it, we don't have a chance. So here are my affirmative arguments for free speech. The first is rooted in the Universal Declaration of Human Equality, right? We start with the premise that we all as people have equal rights to hold certain views and to share those views, right? We start from a place of equality. The second thing I think is important is sort of tapping into that anti-authoritarian streak, right? Every activist questions authority. I always joke that ACLU lawyers are the biggest pains in the butts of any group of people you could imagine because all of us have an inherent distrust of authority. And I think a key part of why I think a, a, a robust First Amendment is important is because it's about constraining those in power to regulate what it's okay to say and think. And of course, the people in power can change and they may not always agree with you. And the last thing I wanna leave you with, and I know I've talked for a long time, but the last thing I wanna leave you with I think is maybe the most important. And I think part of why I believe the First Amendment is so important and free speech is so important is because we have to remember that people can and do change their minds. In a polarized society as we have today, it's almost impossible to imagine switching sides, right? And we've all changed our minds about things. And if we're not willing to admit it, we know people who have changed their minds about things. Growing up, my dad was very homophobic. And now, you know, over the course of my lifetime, that his views have changed dramatically, right? That's just one small example, but people do, can, often change their minds. And if we believe in restorative justice, right? If I believe in prison abolition, if I believe that my cousin Ali deserves a second chance, if I believe, as Brian Stevenson said, that we're more than the worst thing we ever did, then surely we're also more than the worst thing we ever said or thought. And that's not to say that we shouldn't speak out when we see things that we disagree with. I'm very much in favor of calling out, right? Counter speech is incredibly powerful. But I think when we go into sort of the idea, and I don't mean to use a, a loaded term of cancel culture, but when we, when we go from criticizing someone's ideas to deeming them unredeemable because they have expressed them, is where I think we lose sight of these important restorative practices and the idea that if I don't wanna send my kid to my room and lock the door, but rather just engage with them and talk to them, I'm not saying we should, you know, it's, it's on all of us to go convince the KKK that they should come out of their hoods. I'm not saying that at all. But I just think that we have to maintain that space of grace. If we believe that people who've committed horrible, horrible crimes are worthy of forgiveness, surely we can remember that folks who, with whom we disagree, even passionately, can be also worthy of grace. So I thank you very much for your time. It's been a pleasure to be here.